today, first, I just want to welcome my family that's here. If we could just, yeah. I'm so excited you guys are here and included in that family is also my fiance's family. So it's just a really special day. And you know, before uh, I was out front with Esther, Pastor Josh's wife, and we were just kind of talking about how so many people have been coming back to church. It seems like today we're seeing so many faces. So if that's you and you haven't been back for a while, we just want to say welcome home. We love you and we're so glad that you're here. So why don't we jump in? Um, if you have not, uh, maybe this is the first time you're in this series, I want to encourage you to go back because Pastor Pierre has been taking us through the Lord's Prayer uh, line by line. And it's so important because at the beginning, he gave us a framework about how when the disciples come to Jesus and they say, how are we to pray? The Lord's Prayer uh, is kind of like the Rosetta Stone. It provides a framework and helps us kind of be a translator. So why don't we just start off by saying the Lord's Prayer together. It's in Matthew uh, chapter 6. Let's read this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. So Pastor Pierre has helped us kind of break down as we engage in prayer. It starts with us acknowledging that God is our father. We have a personal relationship with him, and he's a good father. And hallowed means what do we revere? God is above every challenge. God is above every concern. God is above every false thing that you believe about yourself or that people have spoken over you. And then we say, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Not my will, but yours. And then we say, give us this day our daily bread. This is really important. Our daily bread means grace. God gives us the grace for whatever we need one day at a time. And then we get to this portion. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. You know, before we begin to have a conversation about forgiveness, I think it's important for us to be clear about what forgiveness is. It's a really uh, important topic, but also culturally, people are talking about forgiveness. Did you know in preparation today that there are uh, physical effects on your body when you are remaining in unforgiveness towards someone? You literally get sick. Your body starts breaking down. Your mind can be a place of chaos. So, you know, scientists and culturally, we're having conversations around the importance of forgiveness. But let's turn and see uh, what, what the definition of forgiveness is in the dictionary. Listen to this. And if you have a notebook or maybe you take notes on your phone, I want to encourage you to do so today. Because I'm just going to point you to places that you can go and pray and dig deeper into. The dictionary says that forgiveness is an intentional and voluntary process by which one who was victimized or offended releases the other per person regardless of whether they actually deserve it. Wow. I'm going to read that one more time. Forgiveness is intentional and a voluntary process by which one who was victimized or offended releases the other person regardless of whether they actually deserve it. No one can make you forgive anyone. It has to be voluntary. And intentional means that you have to work at it. You see, forgiveness is not about your feelings. It's not about feeling like you're ready to forgive someone. How many of you who've ever forgiven someone know that it cannot be about when you're ready to forgive? And the most important part I feel of this definition is that it's not about the other person deserving forgiveness. So if that's what the dictionary says, I wonder what the Bible says about forgiveness. Forgiveness is actually the biblical foundation for our entire salvation. 
It's hugely important, hugely. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, he talks about it twice. We never usually read verse 14, which, you know, is the, is the capstone to the whole prayer. For if you forgive other people and they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So if we look at the history of our humanity, you know, in the Old Testament, so before Jesus came, we were kind of caught in this cycle of sin. We try hard, we mess up, we ask God to forgive us. And and we're going to start in Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 through 20. It's a long scripture, but hang with me. It's very important. God is saying, see today, I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. Walk in my ways and obey, and it will lead to blessing. But if your hearts turn away and you do not listen, and you are led astray to bow and worship to other gods and serve them, I tell you, today you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. I call heaven and earth as witness against you today. Here it is. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey him, and remain faithful. You see, from the very beginning, God has always given us a choice. He loves us enough that every moment of the day, we get to choose. And it's been like this since the beginning of time. We're not robots for God. He's not making us do anything. We have a choice. And God has made it very clear from the beginning that when we walk in obedience, it's a blessing to us and the people around us. But when we disobey, there are consequences. And I'm gonna wow you with a fantastic graphic that I made on Word. Our graphics team, recruit me. So this, this cycle here kind of talks about the cycle of sin and grace. So, so God tells us we have choices, but because we're all frail humans, we tend to forget. And just like this scripture says, when we forget, we begin putting our hope and our trust and our worth in other things, which the Bible calls idolatry. And then we start to make choices where we disobey, rebellion, And when we disobey, we experience consequences to our decisions, right? How many parents in the room know that? When your kids are learning consequences to their decisions. And then we experience those consequences. So we confess and we say, God, I know I was supposed to do this, but I forgot. And and, and, and in the Old Testament, there had to be a sacrifice. I know that sounds very strange now in, you know, today. But the, the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice represented two things. One, the death and destruction that always comes with sin. And two, the innocent life to atone for our sins. So so what would happen before Jesus is we were caught in this cycle and, and we kept trying harder. So we'd sin and, and we'd do the sacrifice and we'd try harder. And, and it's easy to think that our, our forgiveness, our right standing with God is dependent on whether we do the right things. But here comes Jesus on the scene because he knows that you nor I have the personal strength or will to obey God. None of us are that perfect. I'm sorry to break it to you. Nobody is. Not the person sitting next to you, not Pastor Pierre. Nobody is that perfect. Jesus alone. So Jesus came, what the word says, as a sacrificial lamb. It says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And and, in the same way that God gives us choices every single day. I think we forget that Jesus was a man too. He chose to submit his will to the Father. He chose to give his life for us. God didn't make him. Remember when he was in the garden praying, sweating blood? He was choosing in that moment, Lord, I may not want to do this, but let your will be done. Sound familiar? So there's this choice, and I think it's important for us to start here about the basis of our forgiveness, because if we think that we're forgiven because of things that we do, or if we think that another person has the power to truly forgive us, we will get caught in a cycle again that Jesus actually came to break. The fact that we are forgiven has nothing to do with what you will ever do. You you will never be more or less loved than you are right now. Has nothing to do with what you do. 
No matter how many times you make the right choice, no matter how many times you don't, God will never love you more than he does right now. And I pray, I've been praying so much for this message, that our ears and our eyes and our hearts would be open to this truth. Because if you don't understand that you are forgiven and set free, regardless of whether you deserve it, we can't forgive other people because we, we withhold it from ourselves. So we have to get this revelation. It's the biblical foundation for our salvation. And we have to remain connected to it. So, so what does this look like? What does working out forgiveness look like? There is a story in John chapter 20 that we're going to keep coming back to today. I want to give you a little context. So Jesus came and he said, I'm here to set the captives free. And remember on Palm Sunday when the people were waving their palms and they're calling him Messiah. And, and these people were oppressed by the Roman government. So they think they're going to be set free by this political figure. And then Jesus allows himself. He chooses to be nailed to a cross. So the disciples who loved him, who were with him, were hidden in this chapter in a room. Jesus has been buried. They're afraid. I want you to imagine all the things that they may have been feeling. Maybe angry at Jesus. Jesus, you said you came to set the captives free, and we're captive right now in this room, and you're gone. Maybe they felt angry at themselves, guilty. They could have done more for him. Maybe Peter felt guilty. Remember God said to Peter, his disciple, I'm going to build my rock on you, Peter. And Peter denied him three times. I, I don't know Jesus. I don't know who you're talking about. Maybe they were so filled with righteous anger about the people that killed Jesus. He was innocent. And they, they were probably right in their anger. Because these people, the very people that Jesus came to set free, were yelling, give us Barabbas. Meaning they were asking to, for, for, for another prisoner to be set free who was a murderer. So knowing that context, let's read the scripture in John 20, verse 19 together. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Pause. So now Jesus has been resurrected. He's appearing. He died. He's resurrected and appearing to the disciples. And he says, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Remember, he was nailed to a cross and pierced in his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Okay, let's pause. I chose this story because I think it represents three crucial places where we can get stuck. One, we can withhold forgiveness from other people and be justified in it. Our friends tell us it's the right thing. And, and from their viewpoint, it is. Because when we are victimized, when we are betrayed, when we are hurt, by the very people that are supposed to love us, it breaks us. But we can get stuck in unforgiveness towards other people, just like the disciples could have gotten stuck. So that's the first pitfall is withholding forgiveness from other people. The second is withholding forgiveness from ourselves. And thirdly, withholding forgiveness from God. I know that sounds crazy, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So hang in there. So let's talk about forgiving other people. When we are hurt or wronged or intentionally bruised by others, we feel like we have a debt that we are owed. And I chose this specific translation. I grew up with a different translation, actually. But I love and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. When we are withholding forgiveness someone from someone, we are demanding our victim's compensation. It's our rights, our right to be angry. 
Give me back what you stole from me, my peace, my innocence, my joy. But when we camp in that place, we get stuck. And forgiveness is about surrendering and releasing the debt, even though it's justified for you to demand it. And this is hard. And this is why I've been praying because I know some of you in this room may have experienced abuse. And I wanna be very clear to say that as we continue this conversation, we're gonna talk about confession. And maybe you didn't have a part to play. Of course you didn't have a part to play in your abuse. But I still think that we can confess of our unforgiveness. And the very hard truth to receive is that we are called to forgive our abusers. And remember, Forgiveness is not because someone deserves it. It's because God has forgiven us. And it also doesn't mean being a doormat and putting yourself in harm's way. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about releasing someone on the inside from what they owe you. And this is crucial to our prayer life. I remember several years ago, I was praying, and, and there was a person when I was much younger, you know, and it doesn't matter, but I, I was a kid, and, you know, we're all angsty teenagers, and I was deeply hurt by someone, and you know when there's wounds that get in you? You know, it's not just like a surface thing. It's in you, and you start believing things about yourself, and I'm praying, and the Lord just brings this person's face to mind. And I heard in my heart, Carrie, I love this person just as much as I love you. And it was a very difficult truth to receive. But I knew that I had a choice in that moment. I could either pretend I never heard it, or I could receive that truth. And the Bible says that we're actually called to bless people that hurt us. And what does that practically look like for me? It looked like starting to pray for this person by name to pray for them like I would pray for myself or my own family, that God would bless them with peace and joy and love and stability and salvation. And remember that story where we talked about the disciples? I think the disciples were at a very critical juncture here because they were probably so angry at those who crucified Jesus. Think about it. You killed my Lord. They were in danger, as we are, when we withhold forgiveness from other people of becoming the very thing that hurt us. These disciples could have become Pharisees fueled by anger and resentment and judgment. And, and we perpetuate the cycle of sin because how many of you know that when you withhold forgiveness from someone, you become bitter and hard it's only a matter of time. It doesn't go away. It gets stronger like a cancer inside of you. So why do we do this? Because we demand the debt that we are owed. But we have an invitation here to confess. To confess of the part that we played. And not only that, but to confess of the times where we take the place of the righteous judge. That is not our place. It's not my place. And I went through a season where, ooh, I was so convicted of this. I was so justified in what I felt was righteous. And God said, Carrie, you remember when he talked to Job? And God said, did you make the heavens? Were you there at the beginning of time? Do you know the story behind this person? You see, so much of us, we perpetuate generational behaviors and patterns. We pick things up and we carry them forward, like anger and resentment and critical attitudes. When we, we have the choice. So we can confess of who God is. When we are struggling with unforgiveness, you know what we can do? We confess of our part and we say, you know what, God, I know that you're so good. I know that I'm weak, but you are strong. And I know that you love this person and I'm gonna pray for them by name. I thank you that, that, that even though I don't want to, your grace enables me to love and to bless. Confession cannot be you-centered. It has to be God-centered. 
So that's the first stuck point. We can withhold forgiveness from people. Secondly, we can withhold forgiveness from God. You know, bad things happen in the world. Remember, we talked about the sin cycle. We've always had choices, but choices have consequences. And oftentimes when we experience bad things happening to us, we blame God. We feel victimized by God, but we don't realize that we are one, we are one strand in this tapestry of life that has been going on for so long that we're often experiencing things because of other people's choices. It's not God's fault. So again, we have to come into agreement with God. We have to confess. We have to say, God, I'm angry with you. Do you think he's afraid of that? You know, if our prayer lives aren't truthful, that's what God wants. He wants honesty from us. He's not afraid of your anger. He's not afraid of your pain. Just tell him and then begin confessing. But God, I know that you are good. I know that you're a good father. And again, think of the disciples in that room. I bet some of them were really angry with Jesus because they didn't understand what was happening. Because what Jesus said did not align with what they could see. And that is the human experience. That's the life we live. And in those moments, we have to confess with our mouths, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to come into agreement with your word. The third and the last trap of forgiveness is forgiving ourselves. So many of us hold ourselves as ransom and punish ourselves because we think that we're doing God a favor. We think that we could never receive the forgiveness of God. But you know what we're doing? We're telling Jesus, your cross wasn't enough for me. What you did on the cross wasn't enough for me. We're rejecting Jesus. It doesn't make us righteous. It doesn't make us martyrs. We're actually coming to, into agreement with the voice of condemnation. It's, it's false humility. And this is really important. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 that talks about two different types of sorrow. There's godly sorrow, which brings us to repentance, meaning change, that leads to salvation, life. And then there's regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow is when we, ch we forgive ourselves, we forgive others. You know, uh, to, you, to illustrate this, there's Peter in the Bible, right? Peter and Ju Judas both betrayed Jesus. But Jesus, Je uh, wow, Judas hung himself because he could not forgive himself. Peter denied Jesus and he received forgiveness. So why do we hang on so tightly? We know all this, these three traps. We know all of this. And we know that we confess of our part. We confess of the grace of God and we have to rely on the grace of the Holy Spirit. But why do we get stuck? I think it's because it requires death. We have to let what we are owed die. And death is so hard but the whole point of being a Christ follower is resurrection. And if we don't allow these things to die within us, we will never embody the resurrected life that Jesus came to offer us. And to close out, after Jesus comes, he's resurrected he breathes on them, which sounds really weird, but he breathes on the disciples and he says, receive my Holy Spirit, now forgive people. He says, now go, I'm sending you. You know where he was sending them? To go and minister to the very people that crucified Jesus. They could never have done that without the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why the crucified Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit and the first commandment was to forgive. We cannot live our lives as Christ followers without forgiving people that have hurt us. You do not have the strength. I don't have the strength. I don't have the grit. I don't have the willpower. And neither do you. It can only come from the Holy Spirit. In chapter 21, right after this, 
Jesus is talking with Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Shepherd my sheep. Feed my lambs. We cannot love the people that have hurt us without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came after Jesus died and was resurrected. We have to let things die, church. It's so hard. I know. I know. But remember, in the Lord's Prayer, the verse before this, give us this day our daily bread. Forgiveness is not a moment. It's not a feeling. It's walking it out day by day. And being a Christ follower means going where we don't want to go. Keep reading chapter 21. He's, Jesus tells them, like, you used to do whatever you want, but I'm asking you to go to hard places. I'm asking you to go to places you don't want to go. And we can't without the grace of Jesus Christ. As Christ followers, we're called to embody resurrection life. So we have to let things die. We, in order to break the sin cycle, we have to remember that we have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. None of us are above the person sitting next to us. We're not. And that's an offensive statement. It's hard. I understand. It's hard. But it doesn't make it untrue. So I want to invite us now, before we pray, to just think about the fact that if you're withholding forgiveness from yourself, God's not. Because your freedom and my freedom isn't contingent on anybody else. They may be withholding forgiveness. If you've wronged someone, they may be withholding forgiveness from you. But they're the ones suffering. You're set free. And if you're the person withholding forgiveness from someone else or from God, I want to invite you to surrender it to God, to confess your part, to confess of how good God is and how much he loves you, and to every single day wake up and say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm going to lay this person before you by name yet again today, and I'm going to release them because I have been forgiven. Would you join me as we pray? God, we thank you for a grace that we can never earn or deserve. Thank you that we are set free by the power of Jesus Christ, not by our good works, not by how well we perform, not by our check mark of being a good person or a good Christ follower. It's about you, Jesus. So Lord, we receive right now. We open our hands and receive forgiveness and freedom that we could never earn. And Lord, if we're struggling with unforgiveness, I wanna invite you to just say by name, maybe quietly or in your own mind, but I want you to say that person or person's name and lay them before Jesus. Say, God, I release them today. You love this person. I bless them with peace. If they don't know you, God, I pray that they would have a radical encounter with a God that loves them. I pray peace in their home, peace over their family, peace in the workplace, prosperity and provision over their lives. Thank you, Jesus, that I have the privilege of continuing the cycle of grace because of you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.